start us off. Great. Uh, and then I'll turn it over uh, to Chipo from, uh, the, from Zambia, who will speak to us a bit more. This session will be broke into two pieces. So we'll be here with a couple of presenters, and then we'll have a, a small switch over, and we'll do a couple of more presenters. The idea, the reason that we have a session like this is because we very much wanted to hear about uh, real practical use cases of evolving programs in the field. Tracker itself as a data model in DHS2 was designed originally with a very kind of almost vertical thought process in mind for individual level data collection, where we know that at many levels of the systems in the countries that we support, they wouldn't be able to do a full scale EMR, for example, at smaller level health, health facilities with community health workers, those kinds of things. But there often is a desire and funding and cadre of health workers for a single disease program where there'll be somebody that comes in that has malaria funding and they want to do a malaria system. They want to collect malaria data and they want to do it at the individual level longitudinal. And so that was kind of the birthplace of Tracker was to be able to do that, do that well. Somebody wants to do a single program, they want to do it longitudinally by patient, by individual item that's being followed. But we also know for many, many countries at this point, they have, they have matured beyond that to where now they will have something like all of their primary healthcare that's being offered at a site with individual programs. They have a TB program, an HIV program, a malaria program, antenatal care program. And often the patient population might be all the same patient population from that catchment area. And they may be enrolled in two or three or four of those services. And so we, with the more re recent release of Capture that you saw Marcus share with us earlier today, we have a much more kind of individual centric tracker rather than program centric. The idea being that you're going to enroll a person and you might enroll them in one, two, three, four, five programs over their life. And in this way, this kind of individual level data capture in DHS2 does become something much more like a shared health record that is servicing the needs of your community at these smaller scale clinics amongst community health workers in village outreach programs, those kinds of things, where still the EMR is not necessarily the appropriate solution, but running something like Tracker on a mobile device or a tablet or through a, a simple web browser is something that can be accomplished. So we wanted to take a look in this session at the, some of the many different ways that countries are using Tracker uh, across various different programs um, and various different disease areas. Uh, we, we know there are countries, for example, like Rwanda that have, have done uh, kind of a combination of many of these different things. You'll hear from the presenters about what their specific challenges have been and the ways that they're starting to use them. And we, of course, will have a community of practice link where you can hopefully engage in a conversation, ask questions, get responses from the presenters and from us here at the University of Oslo. So we invite that. We probably will have time for some live questions as well. So for those of you that are on the, the Zoom, if you want to put questions in chat, that's also possible. For those of you in the room, we'll try to open up for questions as well. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, time and the screen over, uh, Chipo, to you, if, uh, if that works. Are you able to share your screen? Let me do that just now. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we see it and we hear you well. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Chipoch Tambi. I am a senior strategic information officer at the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia. Short for, um, and it's called CIDAS. And I will be presenting on the Android implementation for vaccine management for the EPI OPT program, which is the expanded program on immunization optimization. Okay. So 
The expanded program in immunization, which is the EPI, is among the many programs that is focused on making vaccines available to all the children in the world. So in Zambia, the EPI OPT has been supported um, and it has been supporting multiple immunization services across the country. This has brought together a lot of uh, implementing partners. This is funded by Gavi and the World Health Organization. And CIDERS uh, took part in this with the specific aim of improving program monitoring and data visibility and using the data for continuous improvement. However, the issue we've, we've been having is that we use paper data collection and the use of paper data collection makes it very difficult to monitor the performance of the health facilities in remote areas. Uh, what we needed was a constant monitoring of um, how facilities are managing their vaccines and if they're having any issues. But with paper data collection, uh, by the time the data is reaching uh, the central uh, head office, you'll find uh, a problem has been in existence for three, four months, and that wasn't enough time for, for people to give solutions to, to the problem. And so there, there was a need for a centralized electronic data system that would uh, monitor the adherence to vaccine management standards in facilities. So the methodology of, how, of what we did was that we got um, an event capture program and we created it to collect data on all facilities. And what would happen is a team from, um, from Lusaka, which is the capital city of Zambia, would go to, into all the facilities in, in the southern province of, of Zambia. And we would, we would collect all the responses um, to a checklist, a vaccine management checklist. So this data is collected on the Android, uh, Android app. We use the Android app, app to implement this on tablets. Uh, this is because most of the health facilities we were collecting the data from are, are in very remote areas. And we find that network connectivity is very poor or non-existent there. And so the Android application made it very possible for us to go out there even when we're offline and just collect the data and then later synchronize it to the server. The server is hosted at the CIDERS HQ office. So the data is then extracted and we use that data now to monitor the vaccine management in the health facilities. So whenever there's any issue that has been uh, flagged, we would address it almost immediately. And to take this further, we um, implemented data review meetings and we made, made sure that we held these meetings every quarter and all the issues that had been noticed in the past three months of the, of the data collection were raised in the meetings and solutions were um, had to be uh, formulated right there in the meetings. And every consequent review meeting um, each district had to present on how the solutions have been implemented, just so that we don't keep talking about the same problems over and over again. And so the results of this uh, implementation has been that the vaccine management checklist has been used in 277 <coughs> facilities in, seven, in 13 districts of the southern province of Zambia. And 270 facilities is quite a big number because it means that um, the number of children that have been impacted by this are quite high. Um, since November 2019, when we started this program, when we started the implementation of DHIS2 in this program, um, 5,010 mentoring visits have been recorded so far. So it means that Five, five uh, facilities have been visited 5,000 times and we collected that much data from all of them. Um, the regular data review meetings 
have improved the analysis and the monitoring of facility vaccination practices, which in turn have improved the immunization coverage rates in the Southern province. And so from here, we just see that these are the number of mentoring visits that we've had so far. And uh, when we just started in quarter four of 2020, uh, we had about 792 um, visits to, to facilities. It dropped off, every time it drops off in the quarters, this, the quarter one of, um, of, of, of the year is the rainy season in, in Zambia. And a lot of areas are very, all the, the remote areas are inaccessible sometimes. So the number of facilities we have access to drops in this, in this time. But then in quarter three, you see it goes up. That's because now it's the dry season and, and facilities are more accessible. And so we managed to go to all those that we, feel, we felt to go in the last two quarters. Yeah, and so the highest number of, of uh, facilities we visited in a quarter, in quarter three of 2021, were almost a thousand visits. And this was such a very, it was a very big feat for us. So in conclusion, um, the DHIS2 Android implementation has improved and eased the compilation of data on vaccine management in various facilities because this has just, it has streamlined how the data is collected. And this has led to the ability to use the data to improve immunization rates due to the monitoring of facility adherence to the vaccine checklist. Yes. So this is it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. And I think what we'll do, given the amount of time that we have for these two sessions, is take some questions in between that can be kind of very specific and targeted. So feel free to think of questions now for, for Chibo. Do you, uh, Chibo, can you turn on your camera maybe? Our, our audience here is looking up at your slides, but it'd be great if they could see your face and maybe ask some questions. Hi, everyone. Let's see, let me make sure I can pull this up on the screen. There we go. Can people see? Maybe. Zoom. Yes, we see you. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> So, so I had an initial question for you, okay. which, which was about the, the mentoring vision, visits. Um, could you talk a little bit about what they do during, during these visits? Okay. All right. So the mentoring visit is um, a visit that is done by the central team from the province, uh, from the province headquarters. And so it will be either a provincial nursing officer or a, a pharmacy, a pharmacist, one of the pharmacists. So um, when they go into a facility, they have this long checklist of questions um, that they ask the, the facility uh, people, either the nurse or the person in charge of the vaccine um, stock. And it's on a number of things. They stock management, trying to find out if um, the facility ever runs out of vaccine stock and what they do. In, um, in, in event of that. There's also uh, management of patients, of, of children, like trying to find out what happens when a child comes to, for, for vaccination, just to see if they're following procedure. And then it's, it's also on storage, trying to find out um, if there are any issues with, let's say, fridge breaking down or um, some, some type of problem like that. So it's just trying to find out everything regarding vaccine management. So it's stock, vaccine stock, it's vaccine uh, administration. It's just everything around that, that they want to find out. They're trying to see if every month a facility is adhering to um, vaccine management standards. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And, and was this a process that they were already doing before when it was just a paper-based system? Or was this a new process that was designed because of the implementation of the capturing individual data? 
So this was a process. So first of all, it was a process that was a bit new. It was being brought into practice. And um, almost right around the same time, uh, we were trying to find a way of implementing it, how best to implement it. So they started and it was paper and they had uh, paper forms and they would go into the facilities with that. And then they would have to come back in, um, to a central place and enter that data. And then a few months later, when we revised the, stand, uh, the systems and noticed it wasn't really working, then we implemented um, the DHIS2 implementation of it and tried that. And so first of all, what we started was, we started with the, just the computer, the, the web-based DHIS2 version, and they would still collect the paper and then uh, bring it to head office and then enter it from there. And then we noticed that also wasn't working. So that's when we, we tried out the Android application as well. And it turned out it was the best fit for us. So it was a kind of like a tiered implementation process. Great, thank you. Are there other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Shibu, for your presentation. Just a few questions. I understand that uh, this was done manually, uh, on the campus I mean manually. And then the Android, is it to bring any change? For example, that would give you an opportunity to remind you that a certain facility you visited last month and tell you you have to do, you have to follow the whole this of activities. Did the facility do that activity or do you still have that challenge? Does that system remind you to do a follow up? Or in your next visit, will you be able to see what you have seen before after the remote or not? So you, you may have trouble hearing, so I'll try to repeat the question for you. So the question was, with this switch from paper over to Android, kind of what were the added benefits to doing so? Were there kind of built-in reminders to the people doing the mentoring, letting them know that they needed to go? Or was there, could you see the previous history that would enrich the ability to do this kind of follow-up? What, what were the benefits? Okay. Okay, so um, we didn't put in any reminders. So uh, it was the visits happen when funds are available and when it fits in the schedule of the person who's going out there. But yes, they are able to see the results of the last visit. And so when they go into a facility, they can see um, what the answers were before. They, were, they can see what the like let's say the stock levels of a certain um, vaccine, they can see that last time this facility ran out of, vac of, of this vaccine or um, these quantities of vials. And they can now compare the responses from now and before. And then also, and that's on, um, on the part of the person who's doing the, the, me the actual mentoring. And then from the head office, um, point of view as well, like the central office, is that we can see trends. And so if, if it points to anything, let's say in the community, let's say a facility keeps running out of a certain vaccine, we know there's something, either the community is, um, like the, the facility is under underserved, the, the facility is not stocked enough according to the community. And this is something we need to uh, present to the to the supply chain people and just make sure that they they provide more or they um, allocate a larger amount of vaccine for that specific community. Yeah. So yes, uh, for on the interviewer on the interviewer part, the mentor part, it helps because they can see past results, and then from the central office as well, it helps because we can see trends which can help change um, a few policy items or a few allocation items. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, then maybe I'll just ask one last one and then Eric, uh, if you can be ready. So what, one last question was for me about kind of reporting rates. Have you seen a difference in the reporting rates since moving? Uh, to this digital system and, and maybe combined with that, are they still doing the paper and the digital or have they moved over to digital? Okay, so they've moved uh, to digital completely. So we don't have any paper, uh, um, we, don't, we don't use paper at all. Um, we, the reporting rates have increased now because um, 
before, let's say, take for instance, the first time we began, we were reporting on slightly above 200 facilities. And by the time, uh, as by the time we were getting to, let's say, last quarter, we were reporting on 277 facilities. So the reporting rates have increased and the frequency as well has increased because there's, there's, um, it's, there's less data loss and uh, they kind of have more access to, to the data as well. So yeah, the reporting rates have really improved. Great. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Chibo. I will give you a round of applause. Thank you. And then please, uh, Chibo, keep an eye on the link to the community of practice. There may be more questions that are added there and you'll have a chance to jump in and respond to those. But now we'll okay. switch over to hearing uh, from Eric. Eric, uh, can you hear us? Is your mic working? Yes, Mike, thank you. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, it sounds great. I'll, uh, I'll let you go ahead and uh, you can share your screen and introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen. I'll try to make it much bigger. Yes, we can see your screen there and it's in presentation mode. Looks great. And hopefully you can see my face as well. Ah, let me look for your face. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> Well, I can see everyone. Uh, good afternoon, team, and it's good to have you here. Yes, we see you now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, my name is Eric Munyam Babazi. I work with HISP Uganda, and I support uh, a number of functions. And one of those functions is uh, to do program monitoring for HISP Uganda. But also, uh, I support DHIS to implementation in a number of ways. Um, with you this afternoon, I will try to summarize um, uh, one of our implementations in country, uh, which is uh, um, the uptake of uh, electronic TB and Liprosec case-based surveillance. Uh, for our national TB and Liprose program at the Ministry of Health. And naturally, it's the Ministry of Health is supposed to be making this presentation, but I haven't really managed to get the person responsible to show up. But I need to also take note that they have been uh, key and have been participating in this process. All right, so um, a quick background. Um, really, this comes from our national strategic plan, uh, which uh, specifies the importance of uh, strengthening information management, including digital technology for the country. And uh, this uh, really specifies the participation of private sector in the reporting through DHIS2, as, uh, you know, uh, mentions the ability for um, establishing e-health infrastructure for case-based surveillance, and also the scale up of um, electronic uh, logistic management information systems for TB and medicines. I had Chip mentioning about uh, drugs for COVID, um, and then strengthening data use for planning at, uh, uh, treatment units and also at district level. So the, in terms of policy and the framework for supporting this for the country, that's already sort of like established and it's in place. And so what was really missing was to have, um, you know, um, a, a real-time case-based surveillance system uh, in place to support a lot of what has been established in these uh, uh, a policy document. And uh, yeah, so in 2020, uh, with funding from CDC and Baylor, Uganda, the ministry started this process of developing uh, the electronic TB uh, case-based surveillance tool um, based on DHIS2 tracker. And uh, of course, all the important aspects in this process is to get all stakeholders that are on board and uh, having their input in terms of uh, where to start from. And uh, of course, 
uh, HISP Uganda being the key partner on DHIS2 in country, uh, were involved um, and the team at Ministry of Health uh, put in place uh, a national core team to support the rollout and capacity building and uh, as well as putting in place a technical working group uh, to provide, uh, coordinate, provide and monitor um, the implementation. Um, the need really for this case-based surveillance tool, uh, which we call the TBL, TBL is uh, TB uh, tuberculosis and leprosy, um, was scaled from having, like I mentioned, the real-time intergroined visual level data collection system uh, for reporting, uh, but also most importantly, track patients along the continent of care. And this is specifically for TB. We know that we have a lot of HIV TB, but this is a program um, within the Ministry of Health or a department whose primary uh, interest is in the disease uh, called TB. Uh, so monitoring patients uh, through the quantum of care, uh, looking at transfers, monitoring appointments, and looking at contact tracing and then treatment outcomes was primarily one of the focus elements for, for having this uh, tool uh, in place. And of course, better quicker tailored response of the program in terms of uh, addressing the challenges of reporting through data system. I also want to mention that prior to this, uh, we were collecting aggregate data as a country um, and being able, of course, pulling this data through the, the national uh, aggregate uh, uh, HMIS, which is the Health Management Information System. Um, so uh, the other point has really, which uh, key here was to have an efficient system uh, for patient care and management uh, to improve surveillance, uh, looking at uh, TB at all levels of service delivery. And uh, wanted to, of course, improve program and resource management at community and health care level, and also to improve clinical care for, for patients. Um, so this brought us to a point um, where DHIS2, the community has also done quite a lot in terms of putting in place tools, resources, um, so that we don't have to start from uh, scratch. Yes, there are lots and lots of tools, but the key here was to uh, start from the uh, WHO Health Data Toolkit, um, which part of that involves uh, or has the TB uh, package um, that has a number of things. Of course, there is the TB package for dashboards, uh, for aggregate data, and also for um, uh, case surveillance, uh, and then drug resistance uh, survey tracker. But we particularly wanted to have a proof of concept, and then we we, put the, we use the TB case uh, surveillance tracker package to do the first uh, initial proof of concept um, for the team at MOH to really have an idea of what this would look like and how it would be formulated. Um, so we, uh, once we had the, um, the, the, the TB package approved, then we went ahead and did an initial assessment to a certain, of course, needs of uh, the readiness for facilities uh, in terms of uh, uptake and how they would use this. Uh, initially, of course, the discussions focused around starting with uh, regional uh, health centers. Here in Uganda, we call them regional referrals. And once we established that uh, those main ones had um, the necessary infrastructure in place and at least to some extent resources, then we were able to uh, start the customization. So uh, worked with stakeholders uh, to fine tune the user needs and the customization for four key programs. Um, they, of course, there were meetings back and forth involving uh, the different teams I mentioned above, um, both at national and also facility level. And then we went ahead and had the, 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 the TB uh, tracker customized based on, the, on our local uh, reporting uh, and TB tracking tools 
uh, both at national and also at facility level. Um, so after we were done with this, we went ahead and did an initial testing in uh, seven health facilities uh, that were both urban and very urban. Um, the initial training and testing was to really a certain, again, sort of proof that these facilities would be able to submit this daily because this surveillance tool is actually a daily tool. As you see a patient and you get them and registered into a TB register, then um, transfer the patient through uh, to the TB tracker. I need to mention that uh, the country policy actually here is that we have both the manual and also the electronics. So we haven't really moved completely to the electronic side. So we did that initial testing to see how that would work. And the results were quite interesting and promising. And then went ahead to do a national and regional training, uh, 515 participants, and then piloting in 97 health centers, and then ultimately scaling up to uh, 228 facilities to date. Um, so very quickly, the tracker is uh, perhaps one of the most successful in the, uh, which we started, I think about nine months ago. And uh, reporting is, is quite um, improved. We are able to get data on all um, uh, kinds of indicators. Um, uh, the system is hosted uh, by the Minister of Health, which is one of the key pointers in terms of uh, um, buying and ownership and then um, internet for facilities that are reporting this data is provided by the implementing partners regionally and then uh, also uh, partners uh, that are supporting TB uh, in these districts and facilities have also uh, helped to provide uh, devices for reporting uh, in terms of laptops Android and also uh, rather Android supported devices. Then um, a key point on this was that we originally had uh, some few parallel systems that were being implemented in different places, including uh, TB, uh, DR or disease drug resistant TB in um, some regional referrals and then also um, some community systems like 99 dots and so many others that were being piloted. So we've gone ahead to, we went ahead to do the migration of some of this data and also the integration uh, of the TB tracker with, uh, for example, we have a system called Uganda EMR that is uh, implemented based on OpenMRS and uh, whose primary role earlier on was for HIV and also HIV TB. So the patients that um, uh, come in, uh, whose entry point is HIV, those ones are now able to seamlessly flow to the uh, TB tracker uh, using that integration. Um, um, yeah, about currently, uh, about 86% of all facilities that have been trained of the 240, are able to um, uh, report on a daily. Uh, we had a couple of backlog in terms of uh, TB case notifications and uh, about 58% of that backlog uh, from 2020 coming to the end of 2021 uh, have been captured as of course, as they continue to report. And then of course, uh, trainings, national and regional continue to happen. And then um, what you see is uh, a dashboard taken out of the reporting rate completeness uh, in terms of a uh, dashboard. The teams are able to generate the monthly, well, actually weekly, monthly, and quarterly, as well as annual progress reports at different levels. So um, some very quick uh, success factors, uh, the buy-in, is, is we've noticed that it's very key. Um, the availability of technical assistance through the Ministry of Health help desk and also HISP has been also very key. 
uh, we've had to put in place uh, weekly feedback meetings uh, and updates uh, through WhatsApp groups. The, the, we have 15 regions and each of the region has its own WhatsApp group that involves uh, TA teams uh, at the national level that uh, continuously give and provide feedback. Um, availability of infrastructure, I already mentioned this, for the facilities that have been trained. Uh, internet, uh, we've had to negotiate um, something called zero rating with uh, service providers so that they add the, um, the URL for the system on, uh, on a zero rated uh, platform. Um, regional uh, partners support training, support uh, uh, on-site mentorships, support uh, visits and so on. Um, we've had also, um, of course, the DHIS to uh, flexibility to generate user-friendly visualizations. These are very key. Um, then facility staff have been trained. And then I already mentioned also the, the integration with some of the existing systems that, that are in the, in the landscape. Um, some quick lessons learned, um, active participation of stakeholders, this is key and very, very important. Um, end user perspectives uh, 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 brought into the customization pro process. process. Uh, this was also very, very important as we didn't find a lot of uh, back and forth. Um, uh, data integration for reporting needs to minimize duplication. I mentioned some of the systems that already uh, in, uh, for example, dealing with smaller components of the TB program, uh, things like DOT, uh, things like VOT, you have there's a small system that is dealing with each of these in the community, but having all of these in one place uh, sort of helps. Um, the linkages um, with uh, localized facility EMRs has also been good. And then uh, the leverage on the DHIS to expertise in country is very, very key and working with uh, different teams, uh, facility and district level, including of course, the uh, district surveillance focal persons, the biostaticians um, and, and uh, and the rest. Yeah, so that was my timer. <laughs> so some few challenges. Uh, we have found, for example, issues where, um, of course, internet is a bit of a challenge and we have to resort to using Android devices like the phones and tablets. Uh, but in most cases, they will take long to push the data because there is no internet. Yes, we've set up the phones and the Android, uh, tablets, but sometimes because they need internet to push the data to the central server, uh, that will take a bit of a time. Then uh, a dedicated data management staff in TB units. Uh, our the, the structure and organization of health centers here is in such a way that you find either the TB unit is merged with the HIV unit um, and then in most cases, maybe even where they are separate, there are no trained staff uh, to you know, manage TB uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so sometimes that becomes an issue. Limited funding to scale up. We currently have um, uh, close to 2,300 health center threes and above, which should be treating TB. Uh, those ones, uh, of those, we've only uh, gone in 224. Um, so the, the scale up is still a bit limited, partly because of funding. And then of course, uh, data management skills. So uh, we are working with uh, all partners at different levels to support the scale up and uh, specifically for procurement as well as uh, engaging on staff capacity building, but also on uh, continuous support supervision and mentorships to mitigate some of these issues. Uh, I take note that my time already expired, but I want to thank you so much for your audience and over to you, uh, Mike. Great, thank you, Eric. 
I know the microphone is not really facing the audience, so I hope you can hear the applause. But uh, we'll uh, see first if there are any questions. I have a few that I can get us started with, but if there are any early ones, yes, please. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for the, for the use case. Um, my question is probably uh, coming back to some of your earlier slides when you uh, talked about uh, probably the use of uh, the paper tools. Um, if I got you very well, it seems like you are using both paper and uh, the electronic tool. So uh, I just wanted to find out to what extent are the workers managing both the systems as they are implementing, are they not I mean, uh, um, using the other over the other? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let me let me ask that one first before I forget because I have to I have to say it into here. So Eric, uh, he's asking about uh, you had mentioned earlier in the presentation about the paper tool and that the paper tool is existing side by side with the tracker based tool. And so it was a question of kind of how does that work and is there a preference amongst the users for one or the other? Are they seeing benefits from the digital one or is it more of a burden? What what do you have to say there? Thank you, Mike. Should I take this or I wait for any other? No, go, go ahead with this one and then I can come back to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you once again. I didn't hear the name, but I appreciate the question. Um, so like I mentioned, our policy uh, in country really is uh, that primarily all systems uh, in, term, in the health sector are paper-based. So any digitalization is supposed to be based on uh, what is existing on the paper. So even as we continue to introduce some of these uh, digital solutions, like in this particular case, the TB uh, tracker, there is an established um, uh, paper-based uh, process that tracks um, uh, reporting uh, through the, uh, the papers. So at the unit, uh, for example, we'll have the, the unit register. And then of that register, uh, we, we normally have, uh, they are called TB uh, client cards. And these, are the, these TB client cards are the ones for uh, monitoring things like appointments, uh, things like transfers and so on. Um, but within the unit register, we will basically every uh, month, no, every quarter, we, they will generate um, a quarterly summary report, which is also manual, which is also manual, and uh, they will normally either earlier on without the DHIS2, those manual reports would actually be sent to the district, and the district would have to make a summary for the district and send it to the uh, Ministry of Health. But now with the DHIS2, they, st they still have the process in place, uh, but the uh, quarterly aggregate summaries are entered within the HMIS, which is the aggregate system. And then uh, there, the Ministry of Health is able to get uh, the quarterly reports electronically. Um, but with the, with the tracker, the idea is to get actual patients um, as and when they are being notified uh, within the system. And uh, so the, the process is, 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 still, is still in such a way that you have the manual processes happening, but then after that, someone has to punch in the individual patients in the, in the TB uh, tracker. I hope that is a bit clear. And uh, the idea, of course, is that with time, they are able. They, once we are able to show that they can actually fully rely on the electronic TB tracker, then uh, some of the manual tools could also be uh, sort of eliminated. Over. Thank you. Thank. Did you want to ask your follow up? Yeah, probably. That's, that's a quick one. Uh, so, so I, I wanted to find out uh, about uh, the, the screening process of the TB patients, you know, presumptive TB client. Is that also captured within the display or only those who have been notified? 
Okay. So the question is about uh, the screening. Is it uh, presumptive as well, or is it only the notified? What, what's included in the system? Thank you. Thank you very much. Quite an interesting question. Yeah, so uh, for the screening process, of course, uh, key to note that there are many entry points for before we actually notify. Uh, you have patients uh, through different um, entry points, and uh, these patients uh, are registered in a presumptive uh, TB register. And uh, out of that, then we, we have to get a lab confirmation. So what we agreed on at the national level here was to take only confirmed uh, TB. So we are not generating, uh, we are not actually picking patients from the presumptive TB, partly because a lot of those are going to be, um, you know, numbers that don't give us the exact uh, uh, caseload. So the team at national level agreed to start with the confirmed TB. And these are the ones that uh, ultimately end up in the unit TB register uh, after they have a confirmed lab report. Thank you, Eric. I, I see a question that just came through in the chat about how you deal with data quality issues, uh, the manual system versus tracker entries at which point tracker is updated. You had mentioned, I'll, I'll add to the question, you had mentioned having a backlog of data that you're getting into the system. What, what is the process for that? And so maybe just some, some thoughts on the data quality and going from paper into the digital. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you, Kalima, for the question. It's quite actually interesting when you flip the, the, the question because uh, for data quality, you really need to the, the sort of the systems are checking each other. And this is how, um, for example, we are expecting to get from the 224 uh, health facilities, we're expecting to be getting daily, um, uh, to be getting daily patient uh, updates or both uh, notified uh, appointments, um, transfers, and, and so on and uh, treatment outcomes. So those were, we are we're expecting to get those daily. Uh, what is interesting is that in the TB tracker, we actually created a replica of uh, summary aggregates like you have seen on the dashboard. Now, those, those summary updates um, sort of they are helping, they help us to see what is actually happening within the facilities before the, before the reporting period, which happens quarterly. So by the time we get a quarterly report in the, in the national system or from the district, we kind of already know where to start with, uh, either by looking at the total aggregate numbers from the TB tracker uh, on a monthly basis and compare with uh, what they have submitted in the manuals, in the manual summary tools uh, at the district level. So that way uh, we are able to follow up and uh, where they are outliers. But of course, what we have seen is that uh, naturally what will be in the uh, quarterly reports that are sent to the district is likely going to be less, partly because either of, um, of, uh, of miscalculations or, 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 or uh, poor, um, poor tallying. Uh, so the, the, what we get in the TB tracker is the, the benchmark of near or near accurate in terms of looking at patients because in the tracker you have the real person you have an actual patient that you're following up through uh, the, the the continuum of care cascade and uh, when you look at the aggregate reports you're not able to tell and tease out um, for example if someone a, a district or a facilitator reported um, 200 or 150 uh, patients notified, you won't be able to know. Uh, so the tracker in a way is actually helping to validate a lot of uh, data that has been uh, reported in uh, manual tools or even in other aggregate systems. So we, had, we do um, monthly uh, data cleaning uh, exercises to look at this. I mentioned earlier that we've been providing uh, weekly uh, feedback uh, for, the, for for individual events, uh, so that by the time we get a report, either a month or a quarter, 
a lot of these issues have been uh, sorted out. Oban, thank you. Sure. Maybe time for one more. Did you have a question? Yeah, thank you hugely for the for the presentation. It's great to see for me the individual level track and really should be the basis of the course. So there's two questions. One is um, that last point on, on data quality. What data quality issues do you see in aggregate data once you've got information on, on individual level track? In HIV, we see you know, big problems with the aggregate data model unless you've got tracker. Hmm. And then secondly, um, how, how have you developed this in relation to some other disease programs? Hmm. So how has TB developed this in relation to HIV? Um, sometimes we're asked to have a TB tracker, an HIV tracker, and then an HIV TB tracker to make sure that you've got testing in TB testing in HIV and HIV testing in TB. So maybe just those two, the two questions, the data quality that it shows, the aggregate issue, and then how you've developed it with yeah, so Eric, the, the question that first, there, there are two parts. The first one is about if you're able to use this tracker individual data to better understand what's in the aggregate data, if you were seeing that there were parts of the aggregate data that maybe were not conveying the full picture, or how maybe you use those two together when it comes to data quality. Are there some checks that you're able to perform with the individual data that improve on the aggregate side? And then the other, I'll save the other part of the question. If you want to address that one, I'll bring up the other part. I, I make, um, did you say you bring up the other one after? Yeah, yeah, go ahead with that and then I'll ask the second. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, we still have two systems. We have the TB tracker, which is currently individual based and it's at the facility. And we also have the HMIS, which is also based on DHIS2 and it's aggregate. Now, um, what we have been doing, like I mentioned, the tools, the, the manual process is already structured. We have a quarterly TB report, which is the, the report that ends up at the Ministry of Health. At the facility, we, I mentioned the primary tools are the register and the TB client card, which are summarized and sent to the uh, aggregate system, which is the DHIS2. So what we are currently doing um, is to, in, within the tracker, we have generated the quarterly summary report. We are able to pick the uh, daily uh, individual uh, patient uh, records, and then automatically generate uh, a quarterly report, which can be compared to the actual quarterly report uh, by the district or by the facility in the EHMIS. So in the, at the end of the quarter, we have two reports, which should essentially be the same. And with the idea is that with time, uh, districts should actually stop uh, sending or manually entering this uh, data in the quarterly report and then pick the quarterly report from the TB tracker because there we are able to pick these patients' uh, data and information uh, directly. So that's uh, currently what, what we are doing. But beyond, of course, beyond that, I mentioned that there are other uh, processes which include uh, data review meetings, uh, uh, which happen on a monthly and uh, weekly basis uh, for the individual patient's data. So that's currently what's happening. We have not yet started pushing the quarterly report generated from the tracker to the HMIS, partly because, of course, uh, uh, scale up is not yet uh, fully complete. Uh, we are uh, the completeness, the the coverage of the facilities is still a bit low. It's 228, um, and that, that, that should be a much smaller percentage compared to the number of facilities we want to cover. Again, I mentioned that we've just been implementing this for the last nine months, uh, and, but we are seeing some really very good progress on this. Um, could I get the second question, please? Yeah, just maybe to, to add to that, that's a, it's a really good question. And it's one actually I think we're still learning more and more about as systems start to have both 
types of data. So we at least have some preliminary evidence that there are uh, kind of systematically going to be differences between individual and aggregate. And for many different reasons, it depends a little bit on what the health programs are. But it, it can be something as simple as kind of the time periods that they're using when they're banding their reports. But it can also be much more serious things where you're trying to count the numbers of visits of a single individual. They're supposed to follow a specific program, but in the aggregate that gets lost. One person had 10 visits, one person had one visit, and they get lumped together and you assume they both had five, right? So you actually should expect some pretty significant differences at times between your individual and aggregate. And I think there's a lot more we can, we can do to understand this. What are the strengths? What are the benefits? What can you learn by triangulating them? Which is again, something maybe we have a couple of additional presenters as well, and we have more times for questions. So that, that concept of triangulating the data and being able to do some checks kind of both ways, I think is still being worked on. We've got some work with uh, both CDC, WHO, Gavi, a few others that are looking at how to do more sophisticated analysis this way. And I think there's a lot more there that we can learn. But I think maybe I'm gonna hold on your other question because it's actually very relevant, I think for some of the other presenters as well. And we're gonna give them some time to go. So Eric, thank you so much. Please stay on. And uh, if questions pop up either in the chat or in the community of practice, uh, you can uh, feel free to jump in, but thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Mike, uh, appreciate it. Great, and then uh, Nene, do we have you? Yes, Mike, I'm Great. around. Thank you so much. Your microphone is working well. Do you wanna go ahead and share your screen? Sure, let me, let me try to share my screen. Great. Okay, we're seeing your slides. Okay, uh, I'm trying to put now in presentation mode. Oops. I okay. hope you can actually be able to, to see my, my presentation. Yes. Now. yes, we do. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll let you just go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Mike, and thanks everyone for, for participating. I'm Neni Rungu, and I'm currently working as a senior technical advisor responsible for research, monitoring, and evaluation under the Malawi Empower uh, activity. And uh, I'll actually be making a presentation uh, titled uh, Use of uh, Data from the DHIS tool to Improve Project Performance, especially looking at the uh, data for adolescent girls and young women. And this is the Malawi Power uh, experience. So I'm actually presenting on behalf of uh, the Malawi Power activity staff, whom we have actually worked together in the, uh, populating this abstract. And the, some of the co-authors include the, uh, Dr. Boniface Market, who is our chief of party, uh, Linda Muyumbu, who is also on this call and um, uh, has actually contributed largely uh, to this presentation and uh, this paper. And then I also have uh, uh, Yona Nyondo, who is also on this call. And um, we are, he's the senior uh, technical officer for, for research and monitoring and evaluation under the Malawi Power activity. And then uh, uh, Matthew Kankurungo, who is also uh, the data and the uh, HMIS uh, manager for, for, for the activity. So, um, our presentation will actually uh, uh, look at basically the introduction, where I actually give a brief overview in terms of um, uh, uh, the project as well as uh, uh, the challenges that we initially had. And then uh, we'll actually look into uh, the methodology in terms of uh, how we're able to uh, maneuver around the challenge that was there. And then you'll actually also be able to share uh, the results uh, what was actually achieved after we have actually uh, employed the different methodologies. And then I'll end up with a, um, a conclusion as well as a, uh, a recommendation. Now, uh, a quick snapshot in terms of um, uh, the project overview. So Malawi Power uh, Activity is a, a paper uh, VS. And uh, for, for this project, we are actually uh, supporting the government of Malawi 
uh, government of Maui's commitment to epidemic control by uh, stopping uh, transmissions as well as preventing new HIV infections, especially looking at the adolescent girls and young women aged between 10 years to 24. So in terms of our target audience uh, for the project, we are only focusing on adolescent girls and young women aged 10 to 24. And uh, we are focused uh, in the uh, two districts of uh, the southern part of Malawi, and these are matching as well as the uh, Zomba district. The project is actually being implemented um, in collaboration with the different partners, and these are local implementing partners with the Family Health International 360, FHI 360 being the prime partner, and then we have got the Christian Health Association of Malawi, uh, commonly known as the CHAM, as a, one of the uh, sub partners, and also the Pagajari Institute of Health and the Development uh, for Communication uh, being the second partner that we are actually uh, working with. So the project is a part of uh, USA, the uh, Dreams uh, project, which is actually focusing on addressing girls and uh, young women. And um, uh, the, the goal of uh, the project basically is to, um, uh, of the Malawi Empower Activity is to actually uh, support the, uh, the transmission of HIV infections among the addressing girls and young women, as I earlier indicated. Now, um, the project uh, is actually providing uh, SRH services, which are sexually reproductive health services to adolescent girls and young women in the two districts. And despite the project's uh, collection, as well as the access to high quality uh, HIV, as well as SRH uh, data, platforms to actually periodically analyze uh, this data uh, to improve project performance were actually uh, minimal. And uh, therefore, there was a need for us to actually be able to um, uh, to use the, the data that we're actually analyzing as a project to help us to make uh, informed decisions for the project at the same time, to actually be able to make uh, mid-cost adjustments where necessary. And also looking at uh, uh, the inadequate skills, especially among program staff, despite that we have a robust monitoring and evaluation team, which is also much skilled in the uh, conducting data analysis. We, all, we also had a challenge where by our program staff we needed to actually be able to have a feel of the data. And uh, this actually, we're actually looking at it that they can actually be able to do this analysis within uh, uh, the, the track uh, which is actually being housed under the DHS2 platform. Therefore, we also had a challenge to actually have a, uh, have a platform for us to uh, performance, which was actually, which were actually minimal. And then in, in terms of uh, the methodology, um, in March uh, 2021, the project actually started in the, uh, 2020, uh, 2020. But then in March 2021, having looked at the, uh, the challenges that I actually addressed uh, in the previous slide, we actually uh, initiated a total quality leadership as well as adaptability uh, uh, model, which is uh, actually a FHI's model for reviewing program performance. And uh, this actually reviews performance on a daily basis in making uh, mid-course uh, uh, collections. And uh, these were actually uh, done through a platform that is called the situational meetings. So the situational meetings are actually a platform for us to actually be able to review data on a daily basis and then utilizing such a platform to actually make mid-course uh, corrections. And the, uh, the model actually uh, requires us to actually be able to set uh, daily targets and also um, coming up with the, uh, a daily tracker, updating um, uh, and informing us on the, the achievements for the day as well as any other challenges that were actually encountered on a daily basis. And then um, uh, through these data targets, we're actually able to, um, to use granular uh, site level data to actually monitor performance to enable program uh, improvement. And then we actually uh, used the DHIS2 uh, tracker, uh, version 2.33.8, to actually be able to capture as well as to uh, analyze and also visualize our individual data on the three uh, uh, sexual reproductive health as well as uh, HIV indicators, which will actually be discussed in the, uh, the methodology uh, during these situational meetings for us to actually be able to identify challenges in HIW uh, service provision, as well as prioritizing uh, local solutions to improve project performance. 
we integrated the DHS2 tracker uh, with the, a real-time interactive Power BI uh, dashboard at community district as well as project level for us to actually be able to uh, track uh, project indicators with the required uh, disaggregations. Now, in terms of uh, the results following uh, this uh, TQLA uh, process, one thing that we have actually uh, noted is that uh, using the DHS2 tracker, we are actually able to systematically analyze and visualize the uh, uh, granular site level data during the situation meetings, which actually led to targeted the uh, program adjustments and it also contributed to an increase in the number of adolescent girls and young women that were reached uh, with the uh, standardized evidence based uh, sexual reproductive uh, as well as HIV services from uh, 13,608 as of uh, Q1 uh, of uh, the year to actually. Um, a total of uh, 56,000 as of uh, Q4 uh, in FY 2021. 20, uh, Furthermore, in uh, out of those addressing girls and young women that were reached with these SRH as well as HIV as services, uh, looking at specifically for addressing girls and young women who access the uh, HIV testing services through. Testing. Our annual target was at 15,008 in accessing HIV testing services as of end of. Um, we're not only providing conventional testing to these adolescent girls and uh, uh, young women, but then we're also trying to make sure that uh, for those adolescent girls and young women that were actually identified uh, HIV positive, they should actually be initiated on the, uh, on treatment. In the uh, we are gonna, we actually saw an increase in as far as the, uh, the number of HIV abuse offered the HIV testing services and those that were actually identified as new positives, increasing from 11 in the, uh, quarter one to a total of about 56, uh, 46 at the end of um, uh, uh, the year. And uh, we actually also uh, ensured that uh, for those that are actually identified as new positives, we should actually try as much as possible to make sure that we are in line with the global campaign of 95, 95, 95, whereby for 95% of those that were actually identified as new positives, at least they should actually be initiated on, uh, on treatment. Therefore, as a project, we actually actually registered a 100% uh, linkage rate uh, and a 99% uh, linkage rate, whereby about uh, 45 of, out of the 46 that were actually identified as new positives were all initiated on uh, uh, treatment as uh, the end of uh, um, uh, the year. So uh, this actually just shows the importance of how we are actually utilizing our data through the situation meetings for them to actually, for addressing girls and young women to actually also be able to uh, access uh, 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 linkage uh, services. Out of uh, the addressing girls and young women who accessed SRH services and 10,460 addressing girls and young women, we are actually uh, access the HIV uh, safe test kits. So HIV safe testing was also part of um, uh, the comprehensive uh, uh, package that uh, the Malawi Power Activity is offering to addressing girls and uh, young women. In the out of um, uh, the 10,460 HIV safe test kits that were actually distributed about 10,253 addressing girls and young women were to actually uh, access uh, these safe test kits. And this achievement actually demonstrates about 19 that we're actually able to uh, um, uh, to register in the, uh, the reporting period. And uh, the next slide that is actually uh, displayed on the screen just actually shows uh, the cascade in as far as the number of test kits that were actually distributed against the, uh, the, how many adolescent girls and young women received the, these safe test kits. In the out of the 10,253 adolescent girls and young women who accessed the safe test kits, 33 were actually screened reactive in the following uh, uh, the safe test. And uh, out of the 33, 30 were actually identified as uh, uh, were actually confirmed the new positive. And all the 30 were actually um, uh, initiated on the uh, on treatment. Um, 
in the conclusion, uh, actually, I uh, want to mention um, the fact that uh, the use of uh, the DHIS2 tracker for systematic as well as periodic uh, granular level data analysis through the structured platforms uh, such as the weekly situation meetings that we're actually able to conduct as a project. One, we're actually able to optimize the use of data to actually improve project performance on key indicators, such as the overall reach with the SRIH as well as HIV services, and also um, uh, on indicators to look at the, uh, the linkage to care for community interventions targeting adolescent girls and the young women. Finally, uh, the process of uh, utilizing uh, data from the DHS2 tracker helped us to actually be able to identify local solutions. At the, at, in the end, we're actually able also to strengthen the capacity of the local implementing partners in usage of uh, the data from the uh, DHS2 tracker. Let me end at that particular uh, juncture and uh, probably maybe hand over the mic to you, Mike, for, for, for further questions or comments, or probably maybe if another presenter is to present at this moment. Otherwise, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nana. So, yes, thank you for that. And it's, uh, I think that with your conclusion slide, we're seeing kind of a theme of, of ways of using tracker data in order to inform monitoring, in order to do periodic analysis, in order to do follow up and compare with aggregate data. There are a number of ways to use it kind of alongside other processes to strengthen them. So that's just, just a theme to point out. We would just mention also for, for, uh, for Ambar, our next presenter, we had uh, thought we were ending this session at four o'clock, but we actually Actually, we'll end at 345 because we're supposed to go take a big group photo with everybody. So I just wanted a time check there, but Ambar, we'll, we'll, we'll leave at least 15 minutes for you. But just maybe if anybody has some uh, questions right now for uh, Nene, any, anything you wanted to follow up from that slide? One, one question that we had held over from uh, uh, the previous uh, presentation was about linkages to other programs. Uh, previously, they, they were talking about TB and leprosy and screenings and notifications. And, and the question was about, are there you know, efforts to take that data and try to compare it or utilize it alongside some of the other health programs, for example, HIV? So I think we could turn the question around here as well to, to ask if there are efforts on the HIV side. Are you, is there a parallel tracker system for TB or some other system for TB? Are there efforts to look and combine the data? Are they the same patient's population? Just curious if there are any linkages there. Hi, Mike, was that mine? Can I pick yes, up the question? Yes, please, right? go ahead, yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Michael. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for that question. And the, the, the straight answer really is that, yes, there is. Um, there is linkage. And actually, for uh, HIV programming, uh, one of the emphasis is that uh, they need to look at the linkage between TB and, and HIV. So, for example, in terms of screening, uh, all HIV patients are also screened for TB um, and, and sometimes vice versa. So uh, in terms of systems, uh, I mentioned earlier that we have an EMR that is doing more or less the, 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 the clacking of, uh, of patients, uh, HIV patients at the point of care. And this data that is collected through this uh, uh, EMR is compared to the data that is collected um, in the in the in the TB tracker uh, in our particular case, and uh, I mentioned also that we uh, have uh, done an integration between the two systems, so that if a patient's entry point is the HIV clinic, and this HIV patient is uh, 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 presumed to have TB and later confirmed to have TB then uh, that patient could actually exist in both uh, systems, but also the, the management of the patient is on both sides, it's both on the TB side and the HIV side. So we, we, the, this linkage is, is there, it is happening. For us, we've gone ahead to integrate both systems uh, to be able to follow this patient through uh, the, the quantum of care. Over. Oh, great, thank you so much. 
Um, and that's a trend I think that we will see more and more of. We've started seeing it happen in, in every country where they're introducing multiple kind of tracker programs that are related, that they start to need to be able to have the same patient in both. But there's probably going to be much more opportunities as well on the data analysis side. So that'll be something that I, I hope to have uh, more for us to talk about as more countries do it. But I, I think we'd better uh, move on and let uh, Ambar have uh, time for the presentation. Uh, Ambar, can you hear us? Uh, is your microphone working? Yes, uh, hello, uh, Mike, uh, and... Uh, Great, thank you so much. Are, are you able to share your screen with us? Yes. Great, we can see your screen. Yes, uh, hello everyone. In fact, uh, I'm uh, from Mauritius. I'm, I'm from Mauritius. Uh, we have a great, uh, I mean, uh, DHIS2 unit here with uh, several programs being integrate, integrated. And also we are planning for other programs also being integrated into GHIS2. For the time being, we have, uh, well, Dr. Dina Singh, the DHIS2 focal person is not here with us for the time being. I'm presenting on behalf of, uh, on his behalf and uh, the behalf of the Ministry of Health on hepatitis case-based surveillance into DHIS2 tracker. I'll start by, uh, by presenting a bit about uh, Mauritius, uh, where is it actually? Because uh, in fact, I've gone to, um, I mean, I've gone to different countries and uh, most of them don't know about uh, Mauritius. It is located on the off south coast of, Africa near Madagascar, and we have a very, in, in fact, it is a more tourist attraction. Well, with the, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, we have a population of uh, 1.2 million, nine districts, and our per, per capita income is around uh, Eight and eight thousand and seven hundred US dollars with an economic growth rate of three point eight percent. Our government health expenditure as a percentage of GDP is uh, three point two percent, and uh, our health expenditure as a percentage of the total expenditure for the government of Mauritius is around seven percent. We were, in fact, uh, based on these indicators, we were driven to be a a high income country by, uh, well, uh, in fact, by 2020, but uh, COVID-19 struck us and is, uh, I mean, other social issues that they are going around the world. Around the world. We have uh, remained uh, our upper middle country. <clears throat> and uh, about the indicators of uh, health system indicators, with five, gen five regional hospitals, with five specialized hospitals. We have one public health, uh, public health institution for every 800 people. Life expectancy is 73.8. Infant mortality is low, while well, 13.8 per thousand live birth. And we have a doctor population ratio of, our, of uh, 29.7 per 10,000 population. In fact, our government is committed to provide uh, universal and quality health services free of any user cost. Uh, our health system is free here in Mauritius, uh, everyone benefiting from it. And we don't have uh, such uh, outreach because uh, everyone is connected to, to the regional hospitals. Well, why DHIS2? Because, uh, in fact, uh, I have been uh, in, a, in a training in the, in the DHIS2 fundamentals course, and we have, the ministry has, uh, has thought DHIS2 to be a very good system for public health uh, reporting. In fact, it is uh, also endorsed by WHO. In 2018, we had the joint external evaluation report uh, by the WHO mentioning that uh, Mauritius needs to upgrade the, syst uh, the system of electronic and real-time reporting. 
So it, it has recommended, recommended for Mauritius to have a robust uh, IT reporting system for the health services. And we have got uh, DHIS2 for, for the, I mean, to use DHIS2 for recording public health events. <clears throat> In fact, uh, we have uh, DHIS2 tracker. We have also DHIS2 data set, two different servers for recording statistics and for recording patient uh, data. We have not uh, only for hepatitis, but for COVID-19 vaccination, the expanded program of immunization of, um, of infants of under five. We have a tracker for HIV and AIDS. We have a tracker for TB surveillance. <laughs> but then from these programs, why I chose uh, hepatitis C surveillance? Because it is in line with uh, our SDG, SDG target 3.3 to end uh, epidemics by uh, 2030 and combat hepatitis. And we have also been um, in, in the verge of uh, elimination of HCV. With the Gilead services, we have had the medicines and all that. That's why we chose hepatitis C because in fact, uh, this is a success story for Mauritius to have hepatitis C surveillance in DHIS2. And also it, uh, I believe there is no built-in package of HCV, which shows the versatility of um, the DHIS2 team in Mauritius to, I mean, to, to not to create an interface by itself for, for each data components into DHIS2 and to show well the DHIS2 team in Mauritius is capable of, I mean, for, to implement, to develop, to implement, and to use the system pro efficiently. This is uh, some uh, screenshots for our Mauritius HMIS tracker into DHIS2. The objectives, objectives uh, for DHIS2 to, to integrate hepatitis C surveillance, indeed for a patient registry. The patient, existing patient registry was on, a, on an Excel. And in fact, uh, it, will, it was a bit difficult for us to, to, to capture all and to report timely for these cases. That's why the DHIS2 was used to collect individual data, to initiate reporting for WHO. That's been our main concern for, for using an electronic uh, system for reporting through means of the, the different components in DHIS2, the built-in charts, the built-in private tables and all that to, I mean, to be able to report to match standards of reporting and, and uh, comply with our surveillance system. And of course, to improve the reporting rate. Using the traditional methods of uh, data capture was, it was fragmented. It was, there had been a lot of challenges. That's why the HISO has enabled us to improve our reporting rate and also to be, <coughs> To increase, uh, I mean, the efficiency of of the HCV screening in Mauritius. This is uh, the team for hepatitis C surveillance. We have doctors, we have physicians, we have the nursing aides. All, I mean, all work together into the DHIS2 for data capture for analysis for reporting. They report to the central level and the central level report to WHO and other stakeholders. They were, I mean, they, they are the primary, primary persons who, who collect data, who are on field to collect and to record HCV data on DHIS2. <clears throat> this is a case-based form. This is a, the dashboard. Now it has, uh, if you can see slowly, we have uh, been working, we have been registering patients. 
and the figures are, are volatile or are, are changing. The the charts, the bar charts for registered by gen registered HIV patients by gender, by age group, by district of residence. I mean, these indicators, these charts were not, I mean, were not possible with the fragmented uh, data capture technique, data capture methods, existing methods through DHIS2. This has improved a lot for these indicators. And I believe uh, if there will be requests for other indicators, it will be possible using the DHIS2. We have uh, done a SWOT analysis for our existing DHIS2 system for the tracker programs. The strength are that we have a political commitment to use a DHIS2. It has uh, taken a, up to a higher level to use DHIS2. Even the Minister of Health is aware, is aware of, and, and he strongly recommends the use of DHIS2 in the different, uh, in other programs. We have good uh, internet connectivity, high internet, high network coverage to use uh, DHIS2 in, even in the, in, in remote, not, well, we don't have uh, such uh, remote places, but uh, at the, the health facilities. In fact, uh, in two days on Wednesday, we, we are, the, we will be distributing uh, tablets to to periphery periphery level for usage of DHIS2. We have the support of the WHO, the University of Oslo, of course, and the HISP Uganda for for their continued help and support for the development for any issues raised. Our weakness. Uh, on the, on, the, on the other hand, that uh, we don't have much funding. We don't have a dedicated funds in the Ministry of Health budget for DHIS2, but still we do have opportunities, opportunities for capacity building, for decentralization of uh, DHIS2 and the integration, integration with the coming e-health project for the government. We need capacity building for program coordinators because we will, when we will decentralize DHIS2, program coordinators need to stand alone for DHIS2 for, for manipulating, for using, for extending their, their, their knowledge into DHIS2. If they, if they want to create, if they want to create indicators, if they want to, to amend a bit of their registration form, they will not need to, they will not need the services of the central level of the DHS to national core team for that. They will be able to do by themselves. Well, uh, the global fund, we would request that the global fund to continue give their support for, to, to Mauritius. And the challenges is still, well, challenges, it's not uh, only for the HIS2, it's for the, uh, the health system as a whole at human resources, because trained uh, human staff, trained health staff, what they do, they get, uh, they get promoted, they get transferred, and they go to a place where the HIS2 is, uh, I mean, is not operational. But however, in the long run, when if DHIS2 will be integrated in the whole health system, even if his staff are trained for a particular program, this knowledge we, he will be able to transmit to the other health programs as well. The way forward is uh, for a capacity building for the DHIS2 national team, which will include the data manager, myself, and the server administrator. We actually have a server administrator, but uh, it's not uh, enough because uh, we still we still experience server issues. We still experience the the dashboards being uh, being not loaded properly. We still, but with the capacity building, with the proper 
proper training, we will be able to, I mean, be a master of the HIS2. For program coordinators, we need the we need to integrate GIS and maps into DHIS2 for visuals of integrators into maps, buffer zones to, to identify high risk regions. We are establishing new programs into DHIS2. The neonatal uh, intensive care unit is in pipeline. Clef flip, clef palate is in pipeline. Integrated disease surveillance and response has already been integrated as a as a data element as a event data capture but we will need uh, to to implement the case based registration form of ideas or into dhis2 for which uh, we are having uh, the workshop on, in two days on wednesday of course we need to strengthen our hiv case based reporting in relation to to HIV and, really, and integrating the whole public health system into it. Well, our ultimate goal for the ministry to build a data-driven culture for real-time reporting. And following that, we'll have evidence-based strategies towards elimination of viral hepatitis. This data-driven culture has, uh, is, not, is not dated uh, not dated for 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 I mean for now it has been dated for long to build it to to use IT to use systems to use electronic system for for reporting for I mean because technology is technology is everywhere around us we knew we need to use that we need to use that out to our maximum for our benefit and uh, we will, I will end my presentation with the final word of thanks to the University of Oslo for the development and sustaining the HIS throughout the HISP Uganda for the continued technical support and consultancy services. Thanks to the WHO for their continuous provision for financial and technical support in terms of uh, consultants, in terms of some finance to use the uh, HIS2 for workshops. Still the government of Mauritius and the Ministry of Health for recognizing the HIS2 as an adequate and promising tool for reporting. And of course the program coordinators, not only for hepatitis, but for other programs being integrated into the HIS2 because without their, their support, without their their help, I mean, it will be, the HIS2 would not have been a success. Well, I mean, uh, <coughs> Mr. Tilak uh, is here among us. A word of thanks for, for you also, for your support, for your technical guidance, for the HIS2 to be a success. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for sharing us the, the hard work going on in Mauritius. Unfortunately, we don't have very much time. I do think you convinced us all to try to have the annual conference there uh, this next year. Uh, it, it looks lovely and we'll look forward to hearing more about uh, the expansion of your tracker programs, but we will need to close this out. There's another uh, activity. So we're saying thank you. Thank you, Ambar. Thank you to all of the, the presenters. Uh, we really appreciate it. And everyone, please do follow up on the community of practice. You can continue the conversation there. So thank you so much. This photo, please go outside quickly.